to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. God, who at various times and in various ways in time past spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. We welcome you today to our study of Christianity Start to Finish. Today we're thinking about continuing the idea of our authority and especially emphasizing it as it relates to the New Testament and the church which Jesus Christ built. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, if you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want you to take just a moment, locate your Bible, get it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. Friend, today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of congregations of the Churches of Christ the Lord's Church in your area. They would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that's Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study. You would be an honored guest at any of their services. In fact, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are deeply concerned with just doing what the Bible says, and who more than anything want to help men and women go to heaven. And so check out the church in your area. You'll find loving, kind Christians there who want to be helpful to others. Friend, we also want to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. We hope that you'll check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From that, you can access all our videos, audios, written material, transcripts, study questions, just a large variety of good Bible study material. If you'd like to have a copy, in fact, of this series of lessons, Christianity Start to Finish, or any of our past lessons, log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Go to our free media request form. We can give you either a digital download or if you need it in another format, DVD or CD, we can make that available to you free of charge as well. And friend, we want to encourage you. If you've got a smartphone and everybody, just about everybody does today, check out the Gospel of Christ app available in both the Android and Apple stores. Great way to keep up with what we're doing and study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. As we mentioned, we're thinking about our authority in matters of salvation, matters of religion. Last time we noticed our authority comes from God. That authority is through Jesus Christ, His Son. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to the apostles. They wrote and spoke what Jesus and God wanted them to. And today, we have the Word of God, which was written by the Holy Spirit through the apostles, which gives us all truth, which is able to save men and women today. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Now, as we think about the Word of God, being our authority, it's really important that we understand what law we're under. In, in the Bible, we have both the old law, sometimes referred to as the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, or the Old Testament, and we have the New Testament, or New Covenant, of Jesus Christ. Genesis, all the way through Malachi, are what we would think of as the old law, Matthew through Revelation, the beginning with the words and sayings of Jesus, going through the book of Revelation, is what we think of as the New Testament. Now, which law does, does the Bible say that we specifically are under? Now, listen carefully. We are not saying that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, is not from God. 
It absolutely is. Romans 15, 4, the things are written before time were written for our learning. Those things are good. We can learn life lessons there. But is it the law I'm going to be judged by today? Remember Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Yes, God formerly gave revelations to the patriarchs and to the, to the religious people of that day, to the fathers, by the prophets. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Moses, Ezra, Elijah, whoever it may have been. But listen to this. But today, for me and you, God speaks through his Son. You see, as a reminder, Jesus has all authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has absolute authority in every way today. In fact, it is the words of Jesus that we're going to be judged by on the last... I'm not going to be judged by the words of Moses or the words of the prophets or the words of some other man. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Therefore, when I stand before God, it's Christ's teaching, Christ's covenant, and the new law of Jesus Christ that I'm going to be judged by today. With that idea in mind, Let's notice the distinction and the clear teaching of the Bible that there are two covenants and we're under the latter, the new covenant. John 1 verse 17, notice the Bible says, The law came through Moses, but grace and truth, remember that truth that saves, came by Jesus. Yes, there was a law given by Moses, Ten Commandment law, Old Testament. But God's grace and God's truth that saves people today that's found in Jesus. In fact, I want you to see a clear distinction of when, I want you to see when exactly the moment, the second in time, where the old law became old and the new law began to go into effect. Notice in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 9, let me show you from the scripture when the new law went into effect. Hebrews 9 verse 15 through 17. And for this reason, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Listen now, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, a couple of things are very evident from this passage. Jesus is the mediator. He's the lawgiver. He's the one who started the New Testament. Now, according to the writer here's logic, when does a new law go into effect? A law, a testament, a will does not go into effect until after the death of the lawgiver. Thus, Jesus being the lawgiver, his will went into effect after his death. And so beginning with the cross of Jesus, that time period where the law is preached and definitely for us today, we're under the new law of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 8 verses 6 and 7, it is a better covenant made on better promises and that God would not have given a new covenant if there had not been a fault with the first. And here's the fault, finding fault with them. The fault wasn't that God gave a bad law. The fault was the people couldn't keep that law. Peter says in Acts 15, neither we nor our fathers could keep it perfectly. And so we have a new covenant today where grace and mercy and forgiveness is available. And friend, not only do we learn when the new covenant went into effect, I want you to clearly see in the Bible, God, when God put that new covenant in effect, the old went out. 
and is no longer for us today. Look in your Bible in Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 13. In that God says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When God gave the new covenant, does this verse teach that the first one became old, no longer in force? Friend, it absolutely does. I want you to think about, just think real quickly about some things that are obsolete, things that are no longer any good. Can you imagine riding to town in a horse and buggy? Well, that's obsolete when you've got an automobile. That's obsolete compared to a bicycle. What about going down to the creek and washing clothes on a washboard? It's obsolete when you've got a washing machine. What about the very first cellular phone you had, a big bag phone? Compared to today, that, that, that's obsolete. The idea is those things are out. They're no longer good. They're obsolete. Friend, the old covenant is out and the new covenant is in. Again, we're not saying it's a bad covenant, but we're living under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Acts 13, verse 38 and 39, uh, Peter said, we cannot be justified by, by the law of Moses. Those who are living on the law of Moses can't be justified by it. They're living a life that's not right with God. Jesus is the way to be justified. We live under the law of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, another couple of passages that I want you to see. Look in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 14 with me. As we think about the new covenant, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 helps us see that line of marcation in the sand where we know when the old law went in, went out, and the new law came in. Colossians 2, verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. Now flip back to Ephesians 2, verse number 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. The law of commandments at the cross of Jesus Christ, he abolished in his flesh the law of commandments. Paul would say, now that faith has come, we're no longer under that law. Galatians 3, verse 22 through 25. Paul says in Romans 7, verse 4, you also are become dead to the law. The law that said, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Paul says, we are dead from, Romans 7, verse 4, we are freed from. The law, Romans chapter 7, verse 6. So friend, we ask, does the Bible teach the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the covenant that we're under today? Absolutely. Now remember, here's what we've learned thus far. The teaching of Jesus came from Almighty God. Jesus received all authority from the Father in heaven and on earth over all flesh, over the church today, in the last day. We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus Christ. Thus, the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit in what they taught and wrote. And that is our only guide in religion. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. It's the new law of Jesus Christ that we're under today and that we're going to be judged by. Now, what does that new law, what does the New Testament teach us about the church that Jesus established and that God wants people when they're saved to become a part of. A friend, you look around the world today and there's a wide variety of religious groups, denominations. What makes the church that you read about in the Bible, the Lord's church, the church Jesus built, different and unique? Well, when we turn to our new law, the New Testament, here's what you learn very quickly about the church. We learn who built it, and we learn who it belongs to, and we learn how many there are. 
Open your Bible with me to Matthew 16, and I want you to see what Jesus says about the church and the nature of it. Matthew 16, verse number 18, Jesus says these words, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Let's ask a couple of questions as it relates to what Jesus taught here. Number one, who did Jesus say built the church? Look at it again. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus built it. Jesus started it. Jesus founded the church. And my friend, that church belongs to him. Jesus did not say, I will build Bob's church. I will build Mark's church. I will build Peter's church. No. Jesus said, I'm going to build it, and it's mine. We can understand that. If you've got a car, you've got a home, you've got some type of belonging, that's, that, that's yours. Your blood, your sweat, your tears have worked and paid for that. Well, the same thing is true with the church. Now, a third question. Not only did Jesus build it, not only does it belong to him, but how many churches did Jesus say he would build? Did Jesus say this? On these rocks, I'll build my churches. It's not what he said. On this bedrock statement, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, I will build my church. Singular. Friend, it was never God's intention that all the religious division that exists today should be here. Jesus prayed that all be one is the idea. Now, as it relates to that church, who's the head of it today? Is some individual in some cathedral, in some place in the world, the head of the church today? Is that in Rome or some other, Springfield, Missouri, or some other place today? Who's the head of the church? Notice in your Bible, Ephesians 1, and I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 22 and 23. Paul says, And he put, God put all things under Jesus' feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Who's the head of the church? God put all things under under Jesus' feet, listen now, and gave him, who? Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. So Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head as it relates to everything. God did not leave matters of worship and salvation and morality and conduct open for men to God. Jesus is the head over all things to the church. God's word is already settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Therefore, we have a head of the church. Please understand, the Lord's church is not like the headless horseman. The Lord's church is not a decapitated body without a head running around. That'd be kind of scary, right? Gee, we're the body. Christ is the head. And that head, is reigning at the right hand of the throne of God today. His word still is just as powerful to save and for us to live and worship by as it ever was. And so we need to understand he's in control of the church that belongs to him. And friend, as you think about that idea, we want to emphasize again, God only ever intended to build that one church. Now you remember Ephesians 1, we just looked at it, verse 22 and 23, Jesus is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And so we saw that the church is the body. The body's the church, church is the body, those are one and the same. Now look in Ephesians 4, verse 4, look at the clarity with which the Bible speaks about the oneness of the church. Ephesians 4, verse 4, among these seven ones, the Bible says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. How many, how many bodies? Now remember, the body is the church. Now, let, let, let's back it up just a minute. How many hopes are there? Well, there's just one hope. How many Holy Spirits are there? Just one spirit. How many lords and gods are there? Just one. No one served two lords. Matthew 6, verse 24. How many bodies are there? There is one body. If the body is the church and there is only one body, the friend, God only ever intended to build one church that belongs to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus prayed that all believers would be unified. John 17, 20 and 21, I pray that they all may be one. Not only did Jesus pray for unity, but the Bible, the word of God condemns division. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 verse number 10 that it's reported that there are divisions among you. Each of you says, I'm a Paul or I'm a Cyphus. Or I'm... Let there be no division among you. Does the word of God condemn religious division and following after the names of men? Well, friend, if Jesus prayed for that and the Bible condemns that, we need to go back to the word of God to learn about the church. Since Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, Colossians 1 verse 18, friend, we don't need to go to any other source other than the New Testament to learn about the organization, the worship, and the name of his church. How should the Lord's church be organized today? Matthew 15, verse 13, Jesus said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted and thrown into the fire. Now, I know Jesus is not talking about horticulture and plants there because in the very next breath, Jesus says, they are blind leaders of the blind. What's Jesus talking about? Groups and foundations that were established on the shaky sand and teaching of man. If a group is not founded on the word of God, it's not going to stand the test of time. And thus, we see the nature of the church. In its organization, that church has elders. Acts 14, verse 23, Paul went and he taught that they should appoint elders in every city. A plurality, not, not, a, not one man, but a plurality of elders were appointed in churches in the New Testament. The, the inspired writers appointed elders in every church. Friend, if we do just like they did, God will be happy with us. Acts 20, verses 17 through 28, those elders of the church in Ephesus we're told in verse 28 to shepherd or oversee the church of God. And so every congregation, every autonomous congregation has elders who oversee. There's not one man and then a diocese and then 10 churches and that one man's over like 50. No, every congregation had elders and they were their overseers. Titus 1 verses 5 through 7, Paul told Titus to appoint elders in every city, and that they were to organize the church as God wanted it to be uh, in the New Testament. Now, as it relates to the organization of that church with elders, the qualifications are very clear. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, an elder must be married, the husband of one wife. That man must have faithful children. Titus 1 verses 5 through 9, 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 7. That, that person is not to be a, a novice or a new convert. And, and there are a lot of other qualifications, but you can clearly see to be an elder, a, a single, celibate, childless man. That, 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 that doesn't fit the pattern that we see in the New Testament. And then under elders in the local congregation, we have deacons. 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 12, the Bible says deacons are to serve well and they are given qualifications as well. Men, husband of one wife, again, having children. So deacons have a place in service and they work under the elders in the local church. And, and that's the hierarchy we see everywhere in the New Testament. Philippians 1 verse 1 is kind of it in a nutshell. 
Paul said to the saints, to all the saints in Ephesus with the bishops and deacons. You've got all Christians, and then you've got overseers, elders, and you've got deacons working under that. And so that relates to the nature of the church that Jesus established. Friend, when you think about the church, we're not just talking about that, that. A lot of times today, here's what you see. You see a one-man run show. You see a big push on money and a big emphasis on emotionalism. And oftentimes you see people who get all worked up over things that, that we don't find happening or, or to happen today. And, and it's so distorted. Named after men, following men's laws, letting one man who doesn't even fit the qualifications for leadership be in leadership. That's completely contrary to what you find in the New Testament. And so here's what we've seen today. The New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is our only law to follow. We don't need the books and the writings and the councils and the synods and the ideas of men to save us. Thank God each of us has our own Bible. We can read the New Testament. We can understand it. We can do what it says. And we can be a part of the church that Jesus built, that Jesus died for. The one church that follows his teaching and is organized according to the pattern we see in the New Testament. And so, friend, we ask you today, as we think about Christianity start to finish, are you a member of that church? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? In Acts 18, verse 8, in the New Testament, as Paul went to preach the gospel in Corinth and other areas, the Bible says many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation? If not, we'd love to help you with that. The local church in your area would be happy to sit down and discuss that. And please join us next time as we think more about God's salvation. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.